recording i will start the session again good morning and welcome to bc103 on new testament survey last class we covered on the introduction to the new testament and we studied on the various empire and uh, and also at the end of last session we discussed about sharing the timeline of the new testament so i request all the students to take a look at the timeline starting from the birth of jesus christ to the writing of the book of revelation I request you all to please take a screenshot of the screen so that you all can look into it and know the different events that took place different uh, uh, different time and what we need to keep in mind as we look into the timeline is these dates the year that has been mentioned are approximate and different colors may code different dates but what we need to look at is these are the real events that took place okay so with that we will move on to the introduction to the synoptic gospels now what are the synoptic gospels what are the synoptic gospels Anyone from the class online? Y'all can chat. Let me look at your chat if y'all have updated anything. Anyone from the session class? So the first three gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called as synoptic gospel. Why are they called synoptic? Because all these three Gospels see together or has a common view. In Greek, synoptic, synoptic means something that has a common view, seeing together. That's why it is called as synoptic Gospel, whereas the Gospel of John is different from the first three Gospels. So Matthew, Mark and Luke cover the same events in the life of Jesus. And most of them focus on the ministry of Jesus in the area of Galilee. So they are more or less in the same order. Nearly 90% of Mark's, the Gospel of Mark's content is found in the Gospel of Matthew. And 50% the Gospel of Mark appears in the Gospel of Luke. And all of the parables of Christ are found the synoptic gospels that is matthew mark and luke and in the gospel of john contains no parables gospel of john has no parables so this these gospels are written over the course of almost a century after the death of jesus all four gospels okay though they tell the same story reflect very different idea and concern so all four people have different perspective though they look but they have a different perspective so they write the story again and again from their point of view so there was a period of 40 years separates the death of jesus from writing of the first gospel so the history tells us little direct evidence about the events of this period but it, it suggests the early christians were engaged in one of the basic human activity what is the basic human activity in those days back then? It's storytelling. So whatever they went through, whatever they saw, you know, they started telling stories. So what we see here in the book of all these synoptic gospels and in the gospel of John, the story has been told and retold. Told and retold. You see the power of word. The word of mouth spread. That's how the gospel was carried out in those days. So it appears between the death of Jesus and the writing of the first gospel of Mark. Till then, the story was told and retold. And they also shared the memories by the word of mouth. And that carried power. And this communication of the word of mouth is called as the oral tradition those days. Okay, so they included uh, telling the stories of Jesus' miracles, healings, and the parables and the teachings that he taught, and also about his death and then the resurrection. The events, uh, uh, even eventually, the stories 
whatever they started hearing, they, uh, some of the scribes or scholars started to write down. So the first written document probably account about the death of Jesus and the collection of his saying and his teaching were written down. So the Gospels were very uh, particular type of a literature and they are not the biographies but then they are the real stories that happen has been written handwritten by certain people who witnessed jesus so each of these four gospel depicts jesus in a different way and they report and reflect the past experience or the circumstance of the author communities they lived in so despite the difference, all four gospel contains the passion narrative and the central story of Jesus suffering and his death. So with that, let's move on to the next slide. Do we have certain questions in our mind about why four gospel? Have you any time thought why four gospels are included in the Bible? Why this number? Why, why not just one gospel which talks about all these stories? Have you any time thought? Why just four? Why not many? There were many people who witnessed, isn't it? There were 12 disciples. I'm sure 12 disciples would have tried to write something of from their point of view. Or why just one? Why not many? So have you thought about it any time? Let's look in what this number four has, uh, what significance, okay? So does this number four have any significance? So the number four is sometimes referred to as the number of earth or the number of creation. So when we say that, why do we say that? Do we see when we look around, when we look at the weather, we see there are four seasons. What are the four seasons? Yes, summer, winter, spring, and fall, four seasons. There are four principal directions. What are the four principal directions? North, south, east, and west. And there are four ancient elements. What are the four ancient elements? Earth, hair, fire, water. So in addition, we can talk about the four corners of the earth the four winds that the scripture talks about. Okay, let's see. The second type we see here is the number four is seen in the following way. The four streams coming out of one in the book of Genesis. Can we turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10? Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. I request the online students also to turn so that we can be interactive in our session. To keep our session interactive, can I request you all to turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10? Let me put the scripture up. Can anyone read, please? Do we have an extra mic? OK, for now, you all can read. In the meanwhile, Anand, you can give them a mic, please. Yes. Whoever's taken, please read loud. Now, I went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and become four rivers. Yes. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads we also see in the book of exodus chapter 26 31 to 32 the four pillars holding up the veil in the tabernacle it says you shall make a veil oven of blue purple scarlet thread and a fine oven linen it shall be oven with an artistic design of cherubim you shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver so what we see here the veil 
was a symbol of Christ's body or the flesh. Now, how do you know the veil was a symbol of Christ's body or its flesh? We see that in the book of Hebrew 10 verse 20. Okay, because we have less time, there are a few scriptures I will read and few I will allow you all to. Okay, so here we see that it, uh, in Hebrew 10, it talks about it compares the veil as a symbol of Christ's body. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And also, what we see here is the four Gospels are the four pillars that uphold Christ as we know him according to the flesh or the earthly Christ. So the book of Acts also presents Christ in his risen and exalted state uh, where, we, where we see Christ according to the spirit or the heavenly Christ in his bodily form on earth. Okay, so why do the diff different account or why do we have uh, let me go to the next question okay the different view from the different accounts about jesus why that's because the four accounts given to us has a different picture of jesus christ on the earthly ministry because in some ways the accountants given us as much insight in the author's perspective of Christ. So there are no two people will look at anything and have the same perspective. They would be certain different in the way they look at. So uh, as an individual, we often affect our impression of things. So in order to give us a well-rounded view of Christ, we see that God has taken the four distinctly uh, different individuals and given them different view of Jesus. So in these four Gospels, we see that uh, we can we can find that uh, find that Jesus in the earthly walk and how we can appreciate him in his fullness nature isn't that beautiful like four people having a uh, viewing jesus in the different views from their perspective from the way they could understand jesus okay so what are the four distinct pictures that the gospel give us about jesus what are the four distinct pictures that the four gospel give us about jesus christ so as we look into each gospel, each one have a significant story to tell about Jesus. Just like uh, a precious diamond should be studied from different angles and different facets so that we can determine the true value of that diamond. So we must see Christ uh, through the eyes of the four observers of Jesus. So the following are the few ways in which, uh, you know, the four gospel show us Jesus as the son of the living God. So the first one, let me see if I have put them. <laughs> okay, so let's study them through this synoptic problem bit and fold it through the four books. Okay, I have listed down. So as we discuss, this chart covers everything. Okay, so we look at them. So throughout the Old Testament, we see the pro four prophetic stream now what are the four prophetic stream when we look at the old testament uh, there are about 300 different prophecies regarding the coming of messiah and all these can be divided into four principle of the uh, of the picture of the coming one so the first one i would like to share is behold your king Behold your king. So these are the uh, uh, eight points that we would be sharing in today's class. That is the four prophetic stream, four tabernacle color, four faces of the cherubim, four genealogy, four Old Testament office, four aspects of a sonship, four different audience, and four evangelists, different evangelists. Okay. So, but when we study all that, 
all that is covered here, where I have given the comparison from the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put under one chart. Well, under the four prophetic stream, we see that it says, Behold your king. One of the prophetic words talks about in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, he says, Behold your king. Here, when we see in the book of Zechariah uh, 9, Chapter 9, verse 9 reads as Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. What does he say? Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a fowl of a donkey. And the same thing from the New Testament. From the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 14 to 16. I request all to turn to Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 14 to 16. So we read it as, Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your King, can you see that comparison word? Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. So yesterday's session, we discussed of some of the leaders, the political leaders. You see in this verse, we see the high priest saying something very important. He's saying, who's our king? We don't have any other king. And he's giving the kingship to Caesar, the Roman authority. So the high priest has a word to say in the Sanhedrin. We read that, right? 17 members along with the high priest, and the high priest has certain authority. So with that authority, the high priest is looking at Jesus, and this, this is the assembly that is gathered in the Sanhedrin, where a council is set, the 70 members, and there the high priest is saying, who's our king? There's no king. Caesar is our king, so crucify him. So with certain authority in his hand, he's saying, so these were the leaders those days at the time okay so whatever we studied yesterday is setting up a stage for us to understand the new testament gospel okay so now you know what a sanitarian what, who are these 70 members who are there part of them and what leadership authority does the high priest have the authority that he hold there and then we see matthew is the gospel that focuses on jesus as the king and as his kingdom. So it is in his gospel, we see that Jesus goes up on a mountain in a kingly manner, and he sits down and gives the laws of his kingdom. So in this genealogy, he also traces Jesus' lineage to the King David. Okay. The next we see under the prophetic stream is Behold my servant. Behold my servant so the comparison from the old testament is zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 i request you all to please make a note all these are very important just make a note okay behold my servant the old testament reference for this would be zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 and in the new testament uh yeah and also there's another old testament reference isaiah 42 verse 1 so we see in Isaiah 42, verse 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. <coughs> Sorry. So what we see, the Mark's gospel, the view of Jesus as a servant of the Lord. So Mark views Jesus as a servant of the Lord. So in Mark's gospel, Jesus has no genealogy. In Matthew, you see there's a genealogy. It goes back to Abraham, then to King David, and then to Jesus. 
But in the Gospel of Mark, there is no genealogy. Why? Why there's no genealogy in the Gospel of Mark? Why Mark doesn't think of Jesus having a genealogy? What do you think? Yeah, each one have a different perspective. So we need to understand what was the perspective of Mark. The perspective of Mark was Jesus being the servant. So no one are bothered of having a genealogy of a servant, isn't it? He's not worried. So what he says is there's no spectacular birth or a heavenly choir. So he, he doesn't record any of these things. He just writes throughout the book, you see, Jesus has a doer. Jesus is a doer. He's a hard worker. He's a man of action. The Gospel of Mark. This is the perspective that Mark is portraying Jesus has. Okay. Now, the third point we see um, under the four prophetic stream, uh, we are still covering on the first point. Okay. The third point is behold the man. The first point we saw behold your king, and we compared, we spoke about the gospel of Matthew. The second point we discussed on behold my servant, and we discussed about the gospel of Mark. Now, the third one we are saying behold the man. The Old Testament reference for this is Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. Can I request someone to please read 12 to 13? Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. I think all of us can take a turn. <clears throat> From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord, he shall bear the glory, and shall set and rule of his throne. So he shall be a priest of his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Thank you. Can one of us turn to Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 5? John chapter 19, verse 5. Sri Radha, would you like to read? Thank you. So John 19, 5 says, Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So Luke's gospel focuses on the humanity of Jesus, and he also presents the true man. So the key title of this gospel in reference to Jesus is as the son of man. Luke praises Christ's genealogy back to the first man, that is Adam. 
So there is a genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, and he traces to the first man. That's the Adam. Now the fourth point here under the prof prophetic stream is, behold your God. Behold your God. The Old Testament reference for this is the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 9. Rin, would you like to read? Book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 9. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Thank you. So it says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your eyes with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. We see the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John focuses more on the deity of Jesus. He presents Jesus as the Son of God. From the very beginning of the verse 1, he starts the Gospel saying, in the beginning, the Word was God. He starts the Word, the first, very first verse itself, in the beginning with God. So his genealogy starts with God himself and with Jesus pre-existent union with the eternal Father. So John places a very great deal or a great emphasis on Jesus' relationship with the Father. So with that, we will move on to the second point. What is the second point? Four tabernacle colors. Four tabernacle colors. So the four colors that we used in the tabernacle, let me change the slide with the four tabernacle colors. Can we see? This is inside the tabernacle, the inner coat. What we see in the inner coat, on the left side we see menorah, the seven lampstand. On the right side we see the showbread, twelve loaves of the showbread stand showbread okay and in the between in the middle we see the incense altar okay and behind the incense altar we see there's a veil that's separating the holy of holies and the inner court now the veil consists of four colors this is the veil that that's uh, in the book of hebrew that denote this veil is compared to the body of christ that we just studied a few minutes before Okay, so this veil has four colors. Let's look into what what does these four colors used in the veil denotes, which is in the tabernacle of Moses. It points out to Jesus. Okay, points out to Jesus in Exodus chapter twenty six, verse thirty one and thirty two. It talks about the four streams of these color. Okay, just let's read. You shall make a veil. Oven of blue. I'm reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 26, verse 31 and 32. I'll just put the scriptures. Exodus 26, verse 31 to 32. Okay, I'll read it. You shall make a veil, oven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine oven linen. It shall be oven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hook shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. Now, what are these four colors talks about? Can we see the four colors in that veil? The first is purple. Now, the purple denotes a kingly color and speaks about royalty. Matthew, in the gospel of Jesus, it 
he talks about the kingly splendor. And then the second color, we talk about scarlet. Scarlet is the color of blood. And it speaks about pouring out one's life in humble service and suffering. So Mark is the gospel that talks about Jesus' servanthood. Jesus as a slave, as a servant. Okay, the third color, fine linen, that is white. Okay, the fine linen was bleached white in the sun, and it speaks about the spotless man who lived a perfect life to become a sin bearer. So, Luke is the gospel of Jesus, which shows a perfect humanity. He was the perfect man who can sacrifice his life to redeem the mankind. The fourth color is blue. The fourth color is blue, denotes the heavenly color and speaks about Jesus as the Lord of heaven. So John represents to us Jesus as the heavenly manna who came down from heaven. John chapter 1 verse 14 says the word in John chapter 1 it's a chapter 1 verse 1 talks about the word in the beginning the word was God and in 14 the same chapter verse 14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us the heavenly God who became a man and dwelt among us it talks about God the word being God, Jesus being God, the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Okay. Now, with that, we will move on to the next slide. Okay. Before I could move on to the next slide, what we see here is the tabernacle. During the time of Moses, this is how the 12 tribes located. In middle was the tabernacle. You see the four directions, north, south, east, west. All the 12 tribes were settled this way. Whichever place they moved and they settled, they settled this way, north, south, east, and west. And each tribe were aligned this way. Can you see that? And in the center one, where you see the smoke, I mean, that is not a smoke, that is the glory of God was present on the tabernacle. So that point is the tabernacle. And around the tabernacle, can you see one, two, and three, four? That those were the Levites who were serving in the tabernacle. They lived there. Okay. And then surrounded them are the 12 tribes. You got it? Can you see that? Okay, done. Now, next. Okay, we'll come back to this picture. We will go back here. Okay, the next point is four faces of the cherubim. What is that? Four faces of the cherubim. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 5 to 11, I request you all to please turn to Book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. Can I request Nina, if you can read? Also, from within, it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They, they had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of cow's feet. They sparkled like, uh, like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went. But Nina, he... can, uh, sorry, can we read verse 10 and 11 
okay and 11 first part okay that's where the face is till there okay. you can read uh, verse 10 yes. as for the likeness of their faces each had the face of a man each of the four had the faces face of a lion on the right side each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side and each of the four had the face of an eagle thus were their faces yeah thank you you can read in detail in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. But the point that we would like to discuss here on, is on verse 10 and the first point of verse 11. So as we see the four creatures face, that is the face of a, um, the face, uh, of a lion, uh, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle and the face of a man. Can we see that here? These are the four living creatures that has been discussed in the book of Ezekiel and also in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Okay, so the lion, what does it denote? Why are these four living creatures been <clears throat> noted here? What is Ezekiel trying to point out? So the lion, the lion with its kingly crown is referred as the king of beasts. So the book, the gospel of Matthew shows us Jesus as the lion, the tribe of Judah. We see that uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 5. And why hawks? Anyone from the class? Why ox? What does ox denote? servant right so the ox was used in those days culture we need to study this with the background the culture the culture those days ox was known as the beast of burden ox was used to carry the heavy load heavy load upon it so the beast of burden and the symbol of ox is the work one is slogging working hard okay so jesus is a burden bearer who's presented in the gospel of mark the third point here we would like to discuss is the man what does man denotes anyone from the class what does man denotes So the Luke's gospel presents Jesus as a man of compassion who's acquainted with the, you know, the humanities, all the emotion that qualifies a human. And he's also a highly sympathetic high priest. Right? Luke portrays Jesus as a man, as a human high priest. Jesus is a high priest. Now, the fourth, eagle. Why eagle? Why a bird? Now, we know, we all know, we're talking from, we're pointing out the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel. What does John talk about? Eagle is a glorious creature which symbolizes majesty. So the eagle soars high above the sky, above the earth, and has a greater vision. Uh, that's why we call you know, the eagle view. Eagle view. The vision to see well beyond the ability of a man. So the eagle has an extra eyelid and is only bird that can look direct at the sun. So John is the one who displays the glory of the Son of God. He has a higher view, overall view of the mankind. Only God has that viewpoint. So he compares that to this creature, eagle. So with that, we will move on to the next one. Which is the next one? D4. Uh, do we have time? 
Okay, we will just complete the point D. Okay, we have two more minutes. Four genealogies. So, what are the four genealogies? The four genealogies are presented in the four gospel, reflects the same four stream. So, the first one, the gospel of Matthew, traces Jesus' lineage back to Abraham. The first one to receive the promise of king and the king David to establish his right to the throne. So even, th even though Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, the oldest child in the royal family inherited the right to the throne. So according to the law, if you come according to the law, Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, was the legal father, even though he was not the natural father. And the second point we would like to state from the Gospel of Mark is, Mark, as I, dis as I shared with you all before, Mark has no genealogy because Mark is portraying Jesus as a slave, as a servanthood. So no one is concerned about a servant's genealogy, a servant's background, right? So he has no genealogy. And Luke traces Jesus' lineage to the man, the first man, that is, Adam through his mother Mary. So this genealogy does two things. One, like Matthew it traces Jesus back to King David and Judah, thus giving him the right to the throne of David. Okay. And it goes way back from David, it goes back to the first man, Adam, and bring a relation about Jesus' genealogy is from the king's men, Redeemer. The last Adam is Jesus, the first man. Adam and the last man Adam is Jesus. Now the fourth genealogy, the fourth gospel, that is the gospel of John, genealogy of God, the pre-existence, the existence of God. So he's comparing Jesus is God and therefore there is no end, there's no beginning. There's no end, there's no beginning. So he just says Jesus is God, he existed in the beginning. He has no beginning and no end because he is God. Jesus is God. This is the genealogy that the Gospel of John points out to us. So with that, we are comparing the four points okay, of four genealogy. And with that, we are covered four prophetic stream, four tabernacle colors, four faces of the cherubim, that is the four living creatures that we discussed. And we covered four genealogies. So in the next class, We'll discuss on the rest of the four, that is four Old Testament office, four aspects of his sonship, four different audience, and four evangelists. Okay, so with that we'll end the session with a word of prayer. Can I request one of you all to please unmute and pray? Anyone from the class can unmute. Sorry, I, I was muted. Emmanuel, would you like to pray? Would you like to unmute and pray? Yes. Jesus, thank you for right. We pray, O oh Lord, for that you will lead us down. We give us strength. We give us our, our strength. strength. What we present unto us. And inspire us with passion to let go about you and know about you. We pray for your silence and protection. Father, thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, each one, for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow. I mean, not tomorrow, next week. So for next three days, that's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, conference which is an annual conference of all people's church so this conference will also be live streamed the link will be posted on the main audi for all our um, online and e-learning student i request you all to please um, as your as the time permits you all can log in and watch the conference online so there won't be any classes for next three days so we will resume
our Bible college classes from Monday onward. Thank you so much. God bless.